599 people in South Carolina are currently waiting for a kidney transplant. You'll meet one of them this morning. Coming up next on Carolina People. Good morning. Welcome to Carolina People. This morning we're at the Fox 43 studio. We're focused on organ donation. And we're visiting with Penny Poston, someone who's waiting for their third, uh, third transplant. Good morning, That's Penny. Right. Great Hi. to see you. Thanks so much for coming in this morning. Thanks for having me. This is vital when we think about organ donation, particularly in South Carolina. Talking to you earlier this morning, understanding the impact of uh, this is a huge waiting list throughout the state. Yes, yeah, especially in the South here where um, diabetes is very prevalent and um, a lot of people lose the function of their kidneys and end up on dialysis and need a transplant. So. To, to see those current figures now, to see 682 uh, transplant uh, folks waiting for transplants mm -hmm. in the state and to see that 500 and 99 of them are for kidneys. Yes, it's staggering. <laughs> it is. Surprising, and a lot of people in the state don't realize that there's that many people out there in need of organs, you know, especially kidneys that are on dialysis. And, um, you know, people think, well, I don't want to donate more my organs, you know, I won't, I won't really help anybody, but they're really mistaken. They mm -hmm. will help a lot of people. Of course, as you said earlier this morning, the fact that we have two kidneys right. and that we could operate entirely without one of them and operate a healthy, virtually normal life or a normal life. Right. We're born with two kidneys and we can definitely live with one. A lot of people are born with two, but one works. Or um, if we get a transplant, um, the one kidney will sustain our life. Mm -hmm. And there's no limit on that. People have lived the rest of their lives with just the one kidney. So, important thing for a lot of folks to think about. Yes, Surely a myth. people don't realize that um, they can live on one kidney mm -hmm. and live a perfectly normal life, have children, um, all that. So, so a lot of folks have the two in, but are really only off, only one is uh, functioning. Yes, absolutely. A lot of people they go to the doctor for a regular checkup and find out that one kidney's working and the other one hasn't been since their birth or something. Mm, wow. So. Real quick about yourself, Penny. Are you originally from the area? I am. I'm Actually, I was born in Maryland, but I moved to the south. Um, I wasn't even a year old yet, and I've lived in Myrtle Beach all my life, except for um, a few years that I lived out west. Mm -hmm. Actually, Merle's Inlet is where. Merle's Inlet is home? Yes. Merle's of course, Inlet you know the bulk of our viewers are in the PD in southeastern North Carolina. Probably a lot of them have been to Merle's Inlet, yes. the seafood capital of Absolutely. the Carolinas. and. Uh, <laughs> That's a great, you love living in Merle's Inlet? I love Merle's Inlet. It's a beautiful place. Um, it was really grown since, you know, I was first here, so. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I think I saw it, the exact definition of uh, uh, the, the issue here that you were diagnosed with at age five was end-stage renal disease. Yes, end-stage renal disease. Um, actually, I got strep throat when I was a child and it wasn't taken care of correctly. Um, I wasn't given enough medication to get it out of my system and it um, ruined both of my kidneys. It completely destroyed them, the function of them. Mm. So I had to go on dialysis and um, was on dialysis until I was nine and got my first transplant at nine years old, mm. which they weren't doing here in the state of South Carolina at the time. So I had to go to Florida to have that done. And that transplant lasted 17 years for me. Is that right? So that was really wonderful. Um, there's really no time limit. You know, nobody says, well, this is going to last 10 years. This is going to last 20 years. Um, I've talked with people that their transplants lasted 20 plus years. Mm -hmm. But for some reason, um, mine failed after 17 years. Mm -hmm. And it didn't reject. It just stopped working little by little. Mm -hmm. You know, it was very interesting to see some of the, of course, as, as you helped lay out for me some of the eventual costs, not only of the transplant itself, but afterwards, and seeing even the issues about it. Is it immunosuppressants? Right, anti-rejection drugs. Mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. And there's usually 
two to three of those you have to take after transplant. Um, you have to take those for the life of your transplant. You, you're not going to get off of them one day. Um, and they're thousands of dollars. If you don't have insurance that covers those, they're, you're looking at five, $6,000 a month mm. just for the medications after transplant. Mm. Mm. Son of a gun. Well, the impact, of course, of the medications immediately after the surgery, leading up to the surgery, and as you say, throughout the life of uh, after, a, after an actual transplant takes place. Share with the viewers that, uh, of course, it's difficult for you to remember back to age five and the time between age five and nine when you received the first transplant, mm -hmm. but even over the course of those, the first 17 years of the first transplant, and of course, assumingly we're coming up on number three, obviously having gone through a second one, we sure want to hear about that. Yeah. The real push is to make sure that, um, that you get that third transplant. Absolutely. Well, I, like I said, I had my first transplant and I did really well and then I started getting um, sick again, filling up with fluid um, because your kidneys, that's what they do. They filter out the fluid in your body and the um, bad stuff that's in your blood. That's what they take care of. Um, so that failed. I went back on dialysis and I was put on the um, transplant list for my second kidney, mm -hmm. which I did receive in 98 um, at the Medical University of South Carolina in Charleston. And um, that one I had problems with right from the beginning. Mm. Um, it didn't want to work for a few days once they put it in. Um, there was a little bit of rejection right away. And I just constantly had problems with that. And it was okay for about four years and then I had to go back on dialysis again um, and this time I'm on hemodialysis which is a different kind of dialysis for me. Okay, share with the viewers real quick and, <clears throat> and, and me even the significance of dialysis and exactly what what do you mean by that? What's occurring when you, I know you talk about going in three days a week right. for many hours of dialysis. What, what's occurring there? Well, when your kidneys fail, you're not able to get rid of the toxins in your body anymore. And you retain fluid because your kidneys are how you get rid of extra fluid in your body. So without dialysis, um, we, we would not be able to live, people that their kidneys don't work. Um, what it does is I go in three days a week, I'm hooked up to a machine by a vessel in my arm, um, and there's actually a filter, and it's like a fake kidney, and it cleanses out your blood. Um, usually three to four hours, your blood goes in the machine, it filters out the fluid and the toxins, and then it goes back into your body. Mm, mm. So it is an artificial kidney, Yes, essentially. it is. How about that stage between age five and age nine, before your first, uh, before the first transplant? Were you on dialysis at that I, age? I was on dialysis at that age, but I wasn't on hemodialysis because I was too young. Mm -hmm. So they put me on peritoneal dialysis, which is done through your abdominal cavity. Mm -hmm. And I had a tube um, in my abdominal cavity, and they would put fluid in there and it reacts with the body and pulls all the toxins out and then it's drained out into a bag. Mm -hmm. And that's how I survived until I had my first transplant. When you talked about after the <laughs> second transplant it not exactly taking and rejecting, mm -hmm. when you say rejecting, meaning that it, it just wasn't functioning the way a kidney should? Well, your body looks at um, a new organ as a foreign body. You know how when you get a splinter in your finger mm -hmm. and it swells up and gets infected? Right. Well, it's foreign. So your body is trying to get that out of there. And that's what mine was trying to do at first. It was mm -hmm. trying to get rid of that kidney. Mm -hmm. But after, it took about a week and it started working really well and um, was okay. But I really had to baby that transplant for some reason. It just, just maybe wasn't that great of a match. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And that is surely one of the critical things. Yes. If a viewer needs to head out to uh, school now or get off to work or just get out of the house, what's the best number? And, of course, the focus today is to try to find uh, vehicles here. Of course, you're one of many in the state, but this is an opportunity to get you in to share with viewers the importance of kidney donation and surely of organ donation across the board. But if there was an opportunity to learn more about organ donation as well as to possibly help you, in this quest, uh, surely some of the overwhelming cost. Is there a good phone number or a good website that a viewer could visit to learn more about organ donation? 
Well, um, actually, the biggest is the National um, Kidney Foundation. Okay. But I am working with uh, some people that are just wonderful, the National Transplant Assistance Fund. Okay. Um, and they have a 1-800 number, plus I believe they have a um, website that you they can do. get on and ask some questions <laughs> and learn about different things having to do with um, any kind of organ transplant, right. actually. That's Not right. just kidneys, but anything. I see transplantfund.org, right. probably a site you visit a lot with a lot of critical information. It has a lot of very important frequently asked questions and a lot of myths and facts about organ donation, which right. are really Absolutely. important. Of course, the 800 number they've got, 800-642-8399, 800-642-8399. Right. Of course, that's a, a Monday through Friday number primarily, but the website's a great resource. Right. And um, there should actually be um, something on the computer about me and my situation mm -hmm. and some possible fundraising. Um, I am doing some fundraising because the insurance I have does not cover the cost of my anti-rejection drugs after surgery, um, nor does it, it cover 20% of the surgery that, you know, the, the transplant itself. So I am having to raise that money. Um, so I'm asking the public, the community, um, anybody that could step forward and maybe do a fundraising for me or help me, um, that would be greatly appreciated. Okay, and of course one of the interesting things there is, is we, uh, one of the myths that a lot of folks have as it relates to the, the cost of donors. They're fearful oftentimes that whether it's a post-death or even prior to uh, someone who's living and willing to to donate one of their kidneys, that that's a huge, going to be a huge cost for them. No, actually, um, when you go into end-stage renal disease, you automatically qualify for Medicare. You don't have to be 65. Oh, great. <laughs> but okay. you automatically qualify for Medicare. And Medicare not only will pay um, for the transplant, but it will also pay for the donor. If the donor... Um, a living donor, right. um, they will pay to have the surgery for the living donor, the kidney removed, and all of that. And also, if it's um, a cadaver kidney, um, they'll also pay for that to be removed and everything. So there is no cost to the donor, no matter what. Mm -hmm. And if it was, a, if it's after death, not a cost to the family members. No, it's not. Surely, an important reason why folks can take the time on their driver's license to check organ donation. There was, at the website for the National Transplant Assistance Fund, it also highlights the, the need to stress to your family that you're planning on making an organ donation or that you're planning on even, yes. oftentimes for some folks, even thinking about donating their entire body for the research or otherwise, but to make sure their family members know. Well, you can put it down on a card. They have organ donation cards, or you can tell the DMV when you go that you want it on your driver's license. But it ultimately comes down to your family members. They make the final decision. Mm -hmm. So you really want to discuss with them. And you know, we think this is kind of a morbid thing to discuss with anybody, but you know, think about all those people out there that you're helping, mm -hmm. that can't survive, that um, depend on a machine three days a week to keep them going, you know, or that, that their heart doesn't function right, or they have liver damage, or I mean, there's so much you can do, you know, after having an organ transplant that you couldn't do before. Mm -hmm. What are some of the other myths that folks may have or may have heard of oftentimes that impact their entire decision as to whether or not they'll make an organ donation? Have you heard of some, some other concerns that people have oftentimes? Well, there's actually a lot that I've heard. Um, one of the main ones that people have told me is that they're afraid that if they got sick or if they were in an accident and weren't able to speak, that health care um, doctors, nurses, right. wouldn't take good care of them, right. you know. And that's so, so not true, you know. It, it's just not. Mm -hmm. You know, they don't see on your driver's license, oh, you're a donor and we're not going to do anything so to help you. you. It doesn't right, work right, right. that way, yeah. you know, mm -hmm. not at all. That's the scariest thing, I think, for people. And a lot of people don't realize, you know, that you can live with one kidney. Um, 
That is a critical component. Obviously, that's not the same issue with the heart. You don't have two hearts. You don't have two, I mean, you know, the liver and other components that are in there. But surely the aspect for kidneys, that's invaluable. Probably something that a heck of a lot of folks don't know. No, a lot. A lot of people don't understand that. When we think about who can become a donor, how do they go through the steps of figuring out, I mean, what would be an opportune match for you? Let's say for Penny Poston, who would be an opportune match if someone could say that I'm willing to live without one of my kidneys? Well, first of all, what they do is the center where I'm going to have my transplant, which is MUSC in Charleston, they would have to call there and get in touch with one of the social workers that handles the transplant. Well, I lost track of what I was going to say. No, that's fine. I was just trying to think of when we think about what's an exact match for somebody. If someone's looking for a kidney. Well, what they have to do, basically, they have to draw blood. And first they need to see if you're the same blood type. Right. And I'm A positive. Okay. So, and then there are certain markers on your blood cells that they match. Like, they look at six markers on my blood, and then they match those to see if the person has the same six markers on their blood. And not always is it a perfect match. Not always do they get six out of six. But sometimes they do. And that's basically how they do it. And they actually mix your blood with the person's blood in a little dish and see if it reacts or not. Right. If it reacts, well, then they know that that kidney would probably try to reject if it was in your body. Mm-hmm. So it's a pretty easy step if someone was thinking about or was contemplating possibly donating a kidney. Yes, it's pretty easy to find out if you're a match, depending on your age and your health as far as the donor is concerned. They might do a few tests. They might have you have like a stress test for your heart to make sure that's okay and maybe do a couple of x-rays and things. Definitely draw blood, but just to see if, you know, they don't want to do surgery on the donor if they don't know they're in really good shape, of course. Absolutely. So those are important issues for donors to go through to make sure they're healthy. Of course, that aspect of the cost for a transplant, can you share with the viewers to give an idea of the actual dollars that are associated with that? Of course, as you said, when you're going through the steps, Medicare, at least with the end-stage renal disease, Medicare will step in and cover the cost of the transplant, but of course... Pay most of it. Pay most of it, excuse me. And of course, but after the fact, after the transplant, there's still a heck of a lot of financial burden for you and your family and everyone dealing with this. Absolutely, especially with medication. And just think, too, there's no hospital locally here, you know, not in Myrtle Beach, or so we have to travel all the way to Charleston. And and usually after transplant, that's back and forth a couple mm-hmm. of times a week. Mm-hmm. So there's those expenses too, you know. Um, what are the hot, hard dollars there? Can you share with viewers? Are you well, familiar with what those costs yes, are? Yes. Looking at just the transplant surgery itself, we're looking at between seventy five and eighty five thousand just for the transplant. Mm. Um, that doesn't take care of drugs after medical care in the hospital after that is just the surgery so if you have any complications um, you know we're looking at probably a hundred to two hundred thousand dollars at least Mm -hmm. Mm. to have a kidney transplant golly so of course the two that you've had prior to this are in that same range you know are very very expensive very much so (laughs) yes definitely Penny, you know, as we think through the practical side for you, I mean, you know, it, obviously the dialysis takes a heck of a lot out of, out of you. What, what is that like? What's that like on your body going in uh, for the dialysis three days a week? Well, actually, when I first um, was put on hemodialysis, um, it was harder on me. My body wasn't used to it, so um, I was very tired and. I would get nauseous a lot and have to come home and lay down, go to bed most of the day. Um, I've been on it three years now, so my body's gotten used to it. So it's not quite as bad, but it still wears me down. I'm still, you know, I still find myself really tired. And, um, of course, I can't work right now. Um, I'm a medical assistant, and 
I love to work, I love to do my job, but it's just not something I can do right now because I can't handle the hours. And who's really going to hire me when I can only work two right. days a week? Right. <laughs> so um, it, it makes it hard for me because financially it's just um, I, I do receive um, disability because in stage renal disease is considered, you know, a major disability. Um, but, you know, there would be no way that after my transplant I could afford my medications. Just no way. So much of the goals for any fundraising that would occur now through the National Transplant Assistance Fund, if they either called that 800 number, went online, typed your name in, penny posted. Right. That's a, that's a way. I mean, much of these funds are being raised to help offset cost post-surgery. Correct. Correct. So, so you feel confident that, that a transplant is coming. I mean, how do you gauge that? Well, um, for my blood type, I'm looking at one to two years with the amount of people that are on the transplant list now. Um, but because I've had previous transplants, I'm actually looking at a little bit longer time. So I'm looking at probably three years at least before I get a transplant. Three years. Mm. But, I mean, something could come up, you know, right. and I could receive one earlier than that, but um, that's what the surgeons have told me. And it's because it's having to do with um, each transplant, you get a little bit of the other person's antibodies in your blood each transplant. Mm -hmm. So it's going to be a little bit harder for them to find a match for me. Okay. You know, when we think about some of the factors, how, how organs are distributed, of course, you talk about, I guess, the blood and tissue typing is very high on the mm -hmm. list, making sure that that's critically done. Of course, the medical urgency, right. how long you could survive with or without dial, I mean, you know, with age, as right, you know, um, what point are you health-wise, mm -hmm. you mm -hmm. know, whether you need it right away or not. It's actually a point system. And the more points you have, of course, mm -hmm. the higher up on the list. Mm -hmm. So it's not like, you know, a lot of people think, well, I'm second on the list or I'm fifth on the list. But that's not how it works. Your points can change weekly, monthly, depending mm -hmm. on your blood work, um, depending on your health status, if you're having problems with dialysis. All of that can change. Okay. With geographical location? make a difference? I mean, could someone say, I want to make a donation to Penny Poster, I want to make a donation, could A, geography, if someone said, I want to do it down the street, would that factor in or no? No, even if somebody was out of state and they decided they wanted to, um, you know, donate an organ or make a contribution or anything, no, no. Okay, okay. No. And, and, but can you jump up on a list if someone wanted to make a donation directly to you, if someone had the ability, if they had the A, uh, a blood type, if they had the correct blood type, I mean, is, is that an opportunity? Well, see, if I get a, a kidney from a living donor, mm -hmm. then I don't have to worry about the list. Right. The list is only for um, if someone dies and their family donates their organs. Mm -hmm. That's, see, right now I don't have anybody in my family or that I know that can give me a kidney, mm -hmm. so that's why I'm on the list. The interesting thing, the Department of Health and Human Services, I think last year it announced that the percentage of folks making donations, living persons making donations, were up, up a good 6 to 8 percent, a tremendous, the first time over a number of years that the numbers have been up uh, that substantial amount. So it looks like a lot of folks are thinking seriously, they're seeing the organ and tissue donors save lives, bumper stickers, or they're understanding the impact of kidney donations, and surely in South Carolina we're this is a good 85, 90 percent of the needs. Well, I think, too, you know, people are living longer. You know, we can look at somebody and say, well, oh, my goodness, I hope that never happens to me. Mm -hmm. But I think people are getting, you know, their relatives are, are you know, getting diabetes or, or something that causes renal failure. Mm -hmm. And, um, you know, it, it's someone close to them, and they're realizing, you know, look, maybe I should donate a kidney. There's more education on it now. People talk about it more. There's more shows, you know, that discuss organ donation mm -hmm. and how important it is. Mm -hmm. so. You know, if you did, if you if you weren't able to get the donation, Penny, do you ever think about that? I mean, do you ever think it's going to take too long or? have fears about that? Yes, I do. I think about that every day and worry. Um, my first transplant, I was pretty sick 
before I got it because it had been so many years. Um, um, and yeah, dialysis takes a toll on your body and it, it actually can interfere with your liver, your heart, all sorts of things. So absolutely, um, you know, I'm really not aware how long people can live on dialysis. Um, I'm sure for a long time, but I don't want to be one of those people. I want another transplant. I want to be able to live off the dialysis machine and be able to travel and, and live a normal life. We want that for you, too. Thanks so much for being with us this morning. Thank you for having me very much. Absolutely. Stay tuned to more Carolina People with Penny Poston coming up next. Eight hundred six four two eight three nine nine. That's eight hundred six four two eight three nine nine. Or you can visit the Transplant Fund at transplantfund.org. Take the time to go online. That's www.transplantfund.org. Every day, seventeen individuals lose their lives because organs aren't ready for transplants. You think about it in a single state, in the state of South Carolina, there's six hundred eighty-two folks on a waiting list for organ donation. 599 of those are for kidney donations. Of that 599, 592 are adults and seven of them are children. Think about what Penny was talking about, three days a week dialysis and being there for four and five hours a day and the extent of that, blood flowing through and out of a machine, an artificial kidney. It's an important thing. Humans are born most times with two operating, functioning, strong kidneys. Think about if there are opportunities for you as a living person or after you pass away to extend your life and extend the life of someone else through kidney donation or organ donation, give them a call or visit transplantfund.org.